explanations for this, okay? Um, from uh, the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Um, she's done some work as we've already seen in the previous talk in quantum resource theories and quantum information. Um, and yeah, she's going to talk today about where information meets thermodynamics. So go ahead, Nelly, thank you. Yes, so um, good afternoon for those of you who are in Europe, which I believe might be the majority here. Hope you guys had a good lunch. Uh, greetings from Singapore, which is where I am. And uh, so this is just a photo outside of my window, <laughs> at least when it's daytime. Um, anyway, it's, it's great to be part of this workshop. Uh, so I must really thank the organizers for arranging this. And uh, I'm really looking forward to the sessions ahead uh, to learn with everyone together. Um, so as you see from the title, um, I've actually prepared somewhat of an overview talk, which is quite general. So maybe let me just start with some simple uh, remarks about thermodynamics. I mean, most of us are here are familiar enough with it. Um, this is a field that uh, roughly speaking um, studies uh, energy exchange between systems. So maybe when during your lunch break, you had to had a cup of hot coffee or maybe ice cream, you know, in summer. And uh, you may notice that, well, it's temperature changes as it interacts with the, well, with the atmosphere. And the uh, questions of thermodynamics would then ask, well, how do the specifics of the system change? And uh, what are the relevant observables here? And uh, how long does it take to, to reach a steady, steady state, et cetera? So of course, rigorous statements are probably not so interesting for coffee and ice cream, um, but people are interested in other systems. So for example, you can have a macromolecule immersed in a cell environment, and people want to know how it, how it reaches a steady state. Um, or you can have, let's say, a dilute quantum gas, um, either um, continuous or maybe trapped in op optical lattices, and they're cooled down to very low temperatures. And in these cases, then the questions, uh, um, the answers are not so straightforward. So um, let's take thermometry again for an example. During COVID-19, you've surely taken your temperature at some, some point. Uh, the technology is very mature. You can have an estimate without uh, being physically even in contact with the thermometer because it just detects kind of the infrared radiation. And yet you will surely see um, later during the workshop that thermometry for quantum systems is much more complicated. So there are a couple of reasons for that. For example, you can cause a non-negligible disturbance to the quantum state. And so in general, there's a trade-off between measurement precision versus disturbance. But even fundamentally, well, some uh, systems are even pushed out of equilibrium to begin with. So not only the energy is really, really um, uh, small in terms of the scale, uh, there might not even be a well-defined temperature to, to begin with. So that's kind of the uh, difference, uh, the different world that we're living in now that we're trying to study. So um, this is a little bit of uh, my plan for today's talks. And uh, since it's the first day, so I thought we could have started a bit slow. And I would say uh, something about how uh, both fields, thermodynamics and quantum information, came together. Uh, so the first part, I kind of want to uh, provide a, a storyline on this, which, which I hope to keep basically entertaining. So we, we then move on to talk about entropies, which are central tools in information uh, processing. Uh, we'll see a few kinds of entropies here. And I will say a little bit about how they're used in thermodynamics. And uh, here I distinguish between entropies which are used in the asymptotic scenario versus the single shot scenario. Um, and because this, this becomes a tool that is often used in resource theories, uh, as you see. So in the last part, I talk uh, finally about resource theories, which you have already heard a lot about from Paul. Um, I structured this kind of as a somewhat a short tutorial, I would say. So I would uh, mainly talk about two points. So I will start off with noisy operations, which is just a toy model. And I will discuss some of the technical tools that lets us understand majorization theory. So I will highlight some of the features that makes the theory well clean, nice, and easy to study. Um, then moving on to thermal operations, I then try to highlight a bit how thermal majorization departs and uh, how it complicates the analysis at, at some times. So the, the second point is that, of course, that uh, entropies emerge, um, single shot ones, and they tell us something about um, additional irreversibility, you may say, in, uh, for small quantum systems as we talk about thermodynamics. So this is kind of a handy outline just to keep 
in mind the, the, the logical flow of um, the lecture. This is kind of a long one. So, um, so let's, um, without further ado, let's start. So we start with, with kind of the story. And I must say that the history behind thermodynamics I find really rich because it's, it's one of the most widely applied one. People want to study it. And there's a nice book which I can recommend to people who are curious about its development throughout the centuries. Um, this, this actually contains a very detailed guide starting already in the second or third century. And it gathers all the thoughts and efforts that had gone into well, understanding how do we measure temperature? How do we distinguish between heat and work? How do we see all these variables changing? And things we, we take pretty much for granted these days. And I, I, I find some of the stories very interesting to read and uh, it clarifies some of the bottlenecks such as you know, errors in scientific theory and how the breakthroughs uh, come eventually. So these are part of the scientific heritage that someone working in thermodynamics would, would want to appreciate. Um, well, moving on. Thermodynamics kind of took off systematically when people started, I guess, building steam engines. They wanted to understand how you want to optimize engine performance, um, either in terms of efficiency or power. And uh, Carnot was, of course, the first one who started to argue for uh, an optimal uh, efficiency cycle, which is reversible. I mean, the cycle now bears his name. So this was constructed via these uh, adiabatic and isothermal strokes. And he wasn't able to calculate precisely the, the efficiency back then, but fortunately um, his work encouraged other people to, to do so. And through that, we kind of saw an extremely quick growth of the study of thermodynamics, where all the kind of underlying principles were being observed and established. So there was, for example, Joule, who did really great experimental work in studying um, the conversion of mechanical heat, stirring of liquids, um, into uh, well, mechanical work into heat, uh, which is the change in temperature of the, of the gases. And that led to eventually the understanding of energy conservation and also the first law. Then we have a few others who studied, uh, focus on study irreversibility, making statements about well, what cannot be done when I try to convert uh, heat or energy into work mechanically. So uh, Clausius in particular was the first one to kind of define thermodynamic entropy. Uh, he did it for classical macroscopic systems with well-defined temperatures. And he stated the second law with it. Um, William Thomson, or better known as Lord Kelvin, uh, formulated another closely related version of the second law. And uh, he was actually also the one who uh, noticed the concept of uh, absolute zero temperature, and we, we, which is why now the SI unit bears his, his title. And uh, that was very instrumental to the study of NEMS, uh, where he looked at how does entropy behave uh, in the limit of approaching absolute zero temperature. So at the beginning of the kind of 20th century, we saw all the formulations of these three laws of thermodynamics coming into place. And of course, 30 years after NEMS, uh, physicists started to formulate the zeroth law, which is then a fundamental observation about how temperature emerges as this unique parameter that characterizes uh, equilibrium states and uh, it governs uh, net heat exchange between systems. So uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century, what happened was, of course, the de development of kinetic theory of atoms and molecules. Now, kinetic theory was already around for almost 100 years, but then it faced a lot of resistance from the scientific community because there was not so much convincing experimental evidence as usual. Um, and it was slowly only accepted really after the works of Joule and Clausius. So it was finally picked up by Maxwell and he developed these ideas systematically into statistical mechanics. Um, besides Maxwell, you have also well, two more giants in the field. Uh, Boltzmann worked very closely with Maxwell, which is why you have uh, the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution for energy. And he was also the one who uh, refined the definition of entropy, no longer as the ratio of uh, heat and temperature as Clausius did, but as a function of the number of microstates uh, in, in the system. 
So he was also the one, well, crazy enough to try to derive the second law from starting from the kinetic theorem. And this is kind of known as the H theorem. Not a definitive proof of the second law, if I may say. It contains some, some hidden assumptions that were later revealed. Um, but still a very good start. And uh, in particular, uh, Gibbs took on, on that and uh, defined a very similar uh, function uh, for entropy. And he used it for arbitrary uh, probability distributions on microstates. And he studied different uh, statistical ensembles with, with this. Now, this was kind of a triumphant age because um, the theory of thermodynamics kind of moves from an observation-based study into microscopic models and theoretical analysis. Um, so, but there were still mysteries. And, and the biggest mystery perhaps was that people didn't really understand the physical meaning of entropy. Uh, after all, this is not an observable. It's not volume, pressure, or, or energy even. So, so what exactly is this entropy term? And why does it keep popping up? Um, that was a mystery. And uh, at this point, when statistical mechanics was more or less well established, something else was starting to happen in a different field. So now you have a Shannon, who is an electrical engineer and a mathematician, and he was studying the, the problem of communication. So at that time, there were two main uh, scenarios of interest in the field. So the first one is called noiseless compression, where you want to send a message from one place to another. Let's say you have a picture on the Mars rover and want to kind of send it to planet Earth. And um, assuming that this transmission can be done well perfectly, aka noiseless, um, but it's maybe expensive. So you, you maybe want to be more efficient with your data transmission. You want to minimize the amount of bits that you send across this channel. And that is usually uh, in general possible because um, data usually, like this picture, contains some form of redundancy. It's mostly here, well, shades of gray and brown. So um, noiseless compression would mean that you uh, try to find a scheme to compress this data into a smaller number of bits and then transmit it. And you do it in such a way such that when you minimize um, the ratio of k over to the uh, original message length, you also still want to do it by ensuring that the message that you received at the end is well, is correct. Okay. Um, so this is a this is a, a problem which was relevant for communication back then. And um, a second very similar problem is called noisy transmission, where now the the transmission process is actually noisy. So it's subjected to errors, and instead of getting a proper image, you would get something which well is missing in some points. And of course, you can also circumvent this. And the idea is to essentially send a larger message, contains more redundancy. So even if some of them uh, contain errors or get lost in the way, then um, we could still recover uh, the original message. Uh, so here, the goal is then to maximize the, the, the kind of the message to sense bits ratio uh, while still uh, having the message intact. Um, <clears throat> so both, um, so this is essentially the foundational idea um, for both classical and quantum, say, error correction. And both of these uh, problems, as Shannon were, was studying this met mathematically, he proved that the optimal rates for both problems can actually be derived. And uh, they're given by exactly a function that is evaluated on, on the source or on the error channel. And well, uh, this is exactly kind of the function that was written down by Gibbs, except for small things like having log two instead of the natural logarithm. So he coined this term, uh, this function information entropy because of its resemblance to, to the Gibbs thermodynamic entropy. Remember that this, this is kind of interesting because the, the problem of communication wasn't really concerned about energy exchange at all or, or any other usual observables that the physicists would care about. Um, it was a problem of combinatorics and probability theory. And yet we see entropy coming in naturally as, as a very significant quantity. So this uh, stroke a lot of further interest in understanding the relationship between uh, these two fields. Um, in particular, in uh, 1957, Janus wrote two very insightful papers 
showing why the concept of entropy makes sense in, in statistical mechanics from an inference point of view. Um, he has a very grand sentence in his abstract, which is that uh, he concludes that statistical mechanics doesn't need to be regarded as a physical theory that depends on um, additional assumptions uh, that are not contained in the laws of mechanics, so such as a priori probabilities, etc. Um, and rather uh, than rather than relying on these assumptions, he shows that basically the different statistical ensembles that Gibbs defined um, can be produced by, by a simple principle, which is to maximize entropy uh, given certain constraints. So given, for example, the knowledge about the total energy or the total particle number um, uh, in the system. So this is kind of the point of um, kind of convergence uh, when of, uh, of thermodynamics and information theory through this picture of understanding entropy. Um, of course, another line of thought, which you are all very familiar with, is to go through the, the Maxwell's demon paradox uh, eventually until it finds its res resolution in Zilab engine and uh, Landauer's principle. Um, but that's, that's a story that I will skip for now. And uh, let's talk a little bit more about entropy. So entropy is, is a way to measure disorder or information. And this is, of course, um, studied quite extensively, both in uh, classical and quantum information theory. And um, here, I don't mean just the Shannon entropy, but the quantities which um, arise from it. So for example, there's the conditional entropy, which is a way to measure entropy in the presence of uh, site information. And there's mutual information, which uh, is a way to measure correlations between systems. And um, these quantities can all be defined either with uh, classical random variable or with uh, quantum density matrices. And uh, even more fundamentally, um, all of these quantities can be written as a function of uh, the relative entropy, which we've just seen as well in Paul's talk. Um, and um, <clears throat> This is this is kind of uh, the yes. so so for example the Shannon entropy would uh, is simply the log of d minus the relative entropy taken with respect to the maximally mixed uh, distribution. Now um, Paul has touched a little bit on the the importance of the quantum relative and entropy already. I mean this this really cannot be overstated too much because. Um, it's a measure of distinguishability that we use uh, very often in different areas, like uh, hypothesis testing, error estimation. And, um, and it's also known that because using this quantity as, as something to generate uh, all the other entropies is very useful, especially when we moved into single shot, because in the single shot uh, picture, this nice Venn diagram doesn't really hold anymore. So we would have to use uh, the Renyi divergence as, as a parent quantity to define uh, quantum generalizations of the conditional and entropy and the mutual information uh, that would actually make sense. So um, if we evaluate the, the relative entropy on two quantum states, and uh, if they commute, then uh, the relative entropy would only depend on the spectrum. And this uh, here we would recover the, well, the classical version of this known as the kullback leibler uh, divergence, and this is evaluated on the spectrum of uh, the input states. Now, these quantities are nowadays pretty familiar to someone who uh, is working in quantum thermodynamics because we, we know that uh, we studied non-equilibrium free energy um, in the context of the second law or work extraction, and we know that this can be written, um, completely re rewritten as a, a relative entropy with respect to the thermal state of the system. So the, the decrease in free energy simply means a decrease in the distinguishability of the system with respect to its, its thermal state. And we also know that uh, these, these quantities help us to understand certain features about thermodynamics when it comes to the quantum region. So let me kind of illustrate this with a the, with the classic example. Um, we talked about Landauer's principle. Um, it states that you know, whenever we want to erase the state of a system, we want to reinitialize it, then the principle says we need to invest an amount of work that is proportional to the, to the entropy in the system. Now, if we take the conditional uh, 
quantum entropy, we know that this term can be actually negative, um, which, which doesn't make sense in the first glance, because why would an entropy term which measures this order be negative? And the reason for that is naturally that if you have access to B, and B is actually entangled with A, then that would actually cause your uh, conditional entropy to, to take on negative values. And applying this, uh, applying Landauer's principle to such a system, you would be able to conclude that uh, if your goal was to erase the system, not only you don't need to actually invest work, you can actually extract work out of the process if you have access to site information, uh, which is quantum about, about the system. So this is all very nice. And um, there is usually a catch. And the catch is that all the entropies that we, we see here are almost always useful only when we talk about the IID limit, which means that we are allowed to take um, many identical copies of the system. We want to process them collectively. Or if we don't care about fluctuations at all and we want to just understand the, the average quantities, then the asymptotic um, uh, uh, entropies here are, are sometimes also useful. So the IID assumption is, is a very strong one because uh, it really means that by taking many, in, uh, many identical states, by pure statistics, the, the details of the probability distribution is going to be washed out and the fluctuations will be relatively small. So you would only see the typical average behavior and that would fully characterize the, the system. So we see this in communication theory. Uh, when the entropy gives optimal transmission rates. And if you apply these kind of asymptotic results to non-IID states, then they don't uh, work anymore. So let me just illustrate this a little bit more. So let me consider a d-dimensional distribution. Uh, let's for now just take d to be 10. And uh, let's think about uh, states well, let's, let's say that we want to look at all states which has um, Shannon entropy, which is close to half the maximum, and that, that when the maximum is uh, attained by log D. So non-IID distribution would mean that, well, the probability distributions can look like anything as long as they are normalized. They don't need to be tensor products. So um, let me give us two uh, types of distribution that fulfill this, this condition on the Shannon entropy. So this is, this is one of them. The probability is just distributed on, well, roughly square root D eigenvalues. So the, if you evaluate the entropy, it's just going to be half to log D. And uh, secondly, we have uh, this distribution, which is completely different from this one in the sense that this is full rank, whereas here you have uh, seven eigenvalues, which are zero. And um, <clears throat> here you have one single eigenvalue, which is huge, um, much larger than any of them here. And you have all these tiny um, eigenvalues. So as you see here, the details of the distribution is completely different, but they have the same entropy. So um, it's like exactly the same when we talk about thermodynamics, because while one may be able to extract work from, from a small system, which on average is equal to the free energy, uh, the distribution can be anything. Uh, if it's a stochastic work. And, and in particular, fluctuations would be very large, um, which means that your work can be very tainted by heat. And in a single run, you can be very far away from, from average. So the Shannon type as asymptotic entropies usually don't capture this, this aspect of the, the distribution. So uh, to capture more aspects of a non-ID distribution, uh, people look into generalizations of entropies and, and relative entropies in information theory. Uh, these quantities are maybe not so um, well known uh, in thermodynamics, but they, they have their standard use, uses in, in, uh, in information processing. Um, and uh, the most uh, used, notably used ones out there are called the D-min and the D-max. Um, min and max in general, because the D-min is smaller than the relative entropy, which is then in turn smaller than the D-max. And uh, they're very useful in, ter for, in terms, for example, in uh, cryptography and also in uh, finite size data compression. 
And uh, these are also quantities that pop up when uh, we study work extraction with, with resource theories. Um, so for example, the D-min corresponds to the work that you can extract uh, from, from, from a system um, via the resource theory framework, where, whereas the D-max actually corresponds to the amount of work that you have to invest into uh, creating or preparing uh, the state role. Um, and the gap between them uh, captures a certain kind of uh, irreversibility and uh, well, and, and this gap can, can in general be quite large. So uh, besides D-min and D-max, there is of course the, the Rennie divergences, which uh, you've seen earlier as well, that interpolates uh, smoothly between these quantities. So D0 here would correspond to D-min and then uh, as alpha goes to infinity, you would have, have D-max. And all of these ready divergence, um, as we have seen, play a part when we analyze uh, thermodynamics for small systems. So, um, I mean, the reason why we go through this interlude on entropies uh, is because they really lie at the, at the heart of uh, the resource theoretic framework for, for thermodynamics, uh, which aims to treat thermodynamics and, and information theory processing in, in a single theoretical language. Uh, in other words, um, thermodynamic uh, interactions between bath and system is viewed fundamentally as a process of information transmission between them. And the spectrum of Rennie divergences that inform us about uh, irreversibility and fluctuations away from the, from the IID limit, uh, which kind of brings us now to the, the third uh, section. So um, for resource theories, um, we started, uh, well, we, we've heard kind of the basic idea from, from Paul this morning that um, they give us a generic framework and a very powerful one in order to uh, quantitatively, uh, quantitatively char characterize resources, uh, including thermodynamics. So there are some parts, uh, some main elements of, of uh, that constitute a resource theory. Uh, we would have three uh, states, which are usually those which are, um, well, experimentally motivated, or for example, easy to prepare. Then uh, given, you're, you're then given three operations. And, and in particular, you can usually take several sets of three operations, but they should um, make sense in the very least that if you take three operations and act them on three states, you should not be able to, I mean, suddenly produce a resourceful state, so, for example. And uh, given these two conditions, then um, th there is the question of uh, how do you uh, enable transitions between states which are in general uh, non-free. So these are the, the resourceful states that, that Paul would, would talk about. And um, the question is, when can we identify that the transition is actually possible via free operations and, and free states? And uh, these conditions are usually phrased in terms of monotones, uh, which is functions that behave well, monotonically in the forward direction of the, of the state transition. And uh, this is where majorization and, and all the entropies come in. So uh, some monotones are necessary, uh, meaning that if they are viol violated, then there's no hope at all for the transition to be possible. So they're, they're kind of useful to, to a tool to have. Um, some are sufficient, um, which means that they would guarantee a transition, but they can be sometimes overly strong. So the usual goal is to kind of derive a set of monotones which are jointly necessary and sufficient, so that they will characterize the entire uh, resource theory. So that's kind of the, the main picture. And uh, there are generalizations for this. For example, we've seen that in, in Paul's talk, he, he mentions probabilistic transitions where you can actually calculate the, the maximum probability of successfully of obtaining the target state. Or you can uh, study, for example, putting in the, the initial state to be an IID state and uh, collectively processing and try to understand questions of rates. Then by taking the appropriate limits, you're back into the IID setting. But in general, the framework is fully single shot. So um, we are going to talk a little bit about noisy operations first and then thermal operations. So let's, let's see, have a look at uh, what they are again, revise a little bit. 
um, noisy operations would be uh, having maximally mixed states as, as free states. Um, you can always take in like full randomness and uh, you can take a unitary operation that mixes your system with the, with the randomness and later you trace out um, this, this randomness. Uh, and then you ask the question, well, when does row, um, when can you prepare some row prime uh, from row? Um, and this is a special case of thermal operations. Um, this is, thermal operations would be the more general case, but now the energy eigenbasis of the, of the system and, and the bus actually have a, has a special role to play. So we see that, uh, first we see the, the constraint on free operations would actually incorporate the first law of thermodynamics. We want to account um, explicitly for all the en energy uh, changes, and that would restrict us to unitaries that don't mix between uh, different global energy subspaces or uh, change well change the energies uh, completely. And uh, this is kind of captured by the, the commutation relation. And for free states, this is also kind of without controversy, which is that you can attach a bus, you, you are free to choose kind of the Hamiltonian and the size of the bus, as long as you only use the Gibbs thermal state of fixed temperature. So um, it turns out that also the Gibbs states um, are the only set of free states that you can allow uh, if you have uh, free operations that conserve energy. Because if you allow anything else as free, uh, free states, so if you use non-thermal states here, then you would actually be able to, um, well, get all sorts of diagonal strict state transitions so that the, the theory becomes completely unconstrained if, if that's the case. So indeed, there's on, we can only pick um, free states without uh, trivializing the, the theory. And this is, a bit maybe reminiscent of the zeroth law because the temperature here again emerges as this, this unique parameter that characterizes uh, equilibrium <coughs> uh, free states. So, um, so in, in general, thermal operations feature noise, thermal noise, uh, it features energy exchange and uh, it has a preferred basis. So that leads to the possibility of studying coherences. And, uh, uh, from this formulation, we see the zeroth and the, and the first law, whereas the second and third law actually emerge as state transition conditions. Um, <clears throat> right. So, so here I kind of listed out some of the other resource theories that have been formulated and, and studied. So you see it's somewhat uh, quite a generic tool. Um, and uh, although today we will mainly talk about thermal operations, I, I want to mention that you can extend this basic thermal operations protocol and study it in, in many different ways. So for example, today we talked about, uh, Paul talked about catalytic thermal operations, which is one way. And um, thermal operations have also been extended, for example, to, to look at uh, the case where you actually have multiple conserved quantities. So you have a more restrict, restricted set of free operations. Um, there's also uh, elementary thermal operations, which involve uh, a series of thermalization between two levels. Um, that is mainly uh, to simplify kind of uh, the picture and see if we, well, uh, getting it closer to implementations, I would say. Um, people also have studied what happens when we have uh, non-perfect control over implementing the, the global unitary. Um, and uh, recent works have extended this to the continuous variable setting as well. And uh, one of the possibly interesting directions which is emerging is the study of um, non-free channels or driving fields. So this might be a, a possible extension that we well, look forward to seeing in, in future uh, resource theoretic thermodynamics. So for, for now, we just stay with simple noisy and thermal operations because they, they uh, thermal operations at least uh, in principle already allow for some quantum features uh, such as coherence and uh, system bus entanglement. Um, <clears throat> so um, let's go through noisy operations and let me point out uh, basically three different features that makes it uh, relatively easier to study. So first of all, uh, there's the good news, which is we know exactly what are the state transition conditions. Um, they are necessary and sufficient, 
they can be written down as D inequalities, uh, depending only on the eigenvalues, uh, which is essentially majorization. So that's, um, that's a very simple thing that we know that majorization really characterizes uh, noisy operations fully. Um, and uh, I have a kind of a simple, um, so this, uh, we often also visualize this via what is called the, the Lorentz curve, which is a diagram that plots the, the cumulative probability distribution over uh, both states. And we say that, well, if here we have the, the Lorentz curve of R, and here we have this, this of R prime, then uh, if the curve, one curve lies completely uh, above the other, then we say that, well, R would majorize uh, R prime. Um, <clears throat> and uh, here I kind of have a very small numerical example just to make things concrete. So here I have like a three-dimensional uh, probability distribution R and R prime. And uh, we organize the eigenvalues. And since we know that, well, 0.5 is larger than 0.45, and uh, the addition of the two, the two largest one is also larger than R prime. So we can easily conclude uh, that R uh, majorizes R prime. And therefore, uh, if we have um, quantum states with the eigenvalue spectra corresponding to R and R prime, um, we can always find a noisy operation that uh, performs the transition. So um, going on to pointing out these three uh, features of noisy operations. So the first one is actually a tool that allows us to prove that majorization is indeed necessary and sufficient. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, notice that in, in the noisy operations, coherence in a particular basis doesn't really matter because this, be, this is because all, all unitaries are allowed for free. So I can, in principle, always rotate my initial um, uh, quantum state rho to be first in the same eigenbasis as rho prime. And then the transition becomes simply a matter of constructing the, the classical channel that brings r to r prime. So for the classical channel to actually correspond to taking in this randomness uh, from this, from this uh, noisy operation equation, it has to fulfill a, a simple condition, which is that the rows and columns of, of, the, of the matrix that characterize the channel uh, have to sum up to one. So this is called the bi-stochastic matrix. And um, <clears throat> the statement of uh, the hardy littlewood polya theorem is to say that um, majorization is actually equivalent to the existence of having a bi-stochastic matrix A, such that when acting on R, uh, will give us R prime. So um, that equivalence is what exactly allows us to uh, conclude uh, majorization as uh, necessary and sufficient for, um, for noisy operations. Um, so again, for the previous example, one can easily construct this. And um, because this would be just a simple mixing of the first and the third eigenvalues. And the mat matrix that does this two level kind of mixing, we call a T transform. It's, it's nice because it's, it's simple. And um, while a general biostochastic matrix for a large system might not be so easily constructed. Um, <clears throat> so here I would add a third statement actually, which is uh, also separately stated in the works of uh, Hardy Littlewood and Polya. Um, which, which is quite interesting, actually, because it says that any um, bistochastic matrix A can actually be deconstructed into a series of T transforms, which are these two level mixings. And uh, furthermore, you only need a finite amount of them. But of course, this grows with, with the dimension of the system. Nevertheless, this makes um, the construction of the, the channel a much uh, simpler problem uh, that has more structure. And uh, one more comment is that people have studied also, for example, what is the required size of the randomness uh, in order to uh, perform transitions. And uh, it's, it was also clear how large the bus needs to be. I mean, as large as the system itself would suffice. And that, that's, that's a nice uh, result that we know. Um, so together with majorization, Let's say something quickly about sure functions. 
Um, they are important because not every extended case can be dealt just with by majorization. So we need some simpler monotones to help us understand state transitions. And uh, since they are monotonic, you, you can imagine that they serve as a kind of indicator or witness on at the underlying majorization condition. And uh, we know that there are a couple of functions that, that do have this property. And in fact, if you have a function that is convex and symmetric with permutations, you know immediately that this would be a sure concave, uh, actually sure convex function. And um, all the classical Renyi entropies that we know of are, are also uh, concave, meaning that the negative is, is convex. Um, <clears throat> so this, this will be maybe useful a bit later on. Um, let's talk about the second feature of, of majorization that I, I kind of like, um, which is what we call the existence of a steepest and, and flattest states. So this, this requires a little bit of uh, explanation. Um, so let's start by giving ourselves a state rho, then any density matrix. And we look at the set of all states which are epsilon, epsilon close uh, to it in terms of trace distance. So this is usually also called an epsilon ball. And the ball, of course, usually also contains states that don't commute with, uh, with rho in general. And what we see is that with respect to majorization, there is a, a clear hierarchy that exists within this ball, uh, meaning that I can always find two unique states. Um, the first one called the steeper state. And this state would have the property that it majorizes every single state within this epsilon ball. So with respect to majorization, there's always a clear winner in the set of states um, within an epsilon ball of rho. And uh, it turns out to be also very easy to construct these states uh, explicitly. And they turn out to be quite useful in, in a number of, of, uh, of situations. For example, when you want to say minimize the, the error on, on system or catalyst, etc. So similarly, there is a, a unique bottom as well, which is called a flatter state. Um, it can also be con uh, constructed explicitly and it would be majorized not only by rho and rho steep, but actually all the other states inside this epsilon ball. So if, if I'm concerned about majorization, I can characterize the entire neighborhood of states by these two uh, approximate states. And this is true no matter what rho and epsilon we pick. And uh, so, um, so we would have this statement. And uh, of course, because we know that uh, all sure concave functions are, are monotonic with, with respect to majorization, then we basically know how to upper and lower bound um, all, all the, the sure concave functions within this region by just evaluating them at these two points as well. Um, so just one quick example as to why this neighborhood is in, important. Um, it's basically important when, whenever we are concerned with approximate tra transitions. So for example, you would, um, you, you would have states which are a bit pathological in, in their distribution, and maybe you cannot actually reach uh, row prime uh, via, well, noisy operations exactly. Um, but most of the time, if you're willing to sacrifice uh, the accuracy with some error epsilon in trace distance, then you can relax uh, the conditions and look at uh, transition between these steepest and flatter states. Um, and then you have uh, a very clean way to analyze uh, approximate transitions. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we move on to the third point, which is catalysis. And this, this was already very nicely motivated and, and explained by, by Paul. Um, and this is really the part where, where noisy operations become actually much harder to, to understand. Uh, even just on the case of, of noisy operations, um, because um, how to pick the catalyst is essentially a problem, especially if, I mean, the dimension of the catalyst is constrained and you don't want it to be huge. You don't want it to be correlated with your system, for example. So there are different uh, regions of catalysis that are kind of undergoing, um, uh, well, 
um, studies. And uh, this, this um, catalysis is kind of interesting because if you study it with majorization, then the, the majorization condition has to go directly, well, the, the catalyst has to go inside the majorization relation. So you would have to evaluate the, the eigenvalue spectrums of these ones, but then picking the, the right catalyst is not very obvious. However, if you uh, want to analyze it via sure functions, and if you pick sure functions which are which are additive via by a tensor product, for example, then um, by by kind of writing out um, writing out the uh, the sure functions, you can see that the the well the catalyst kind of drops out of the picture. So uh, it helps to uh, it helps us to identify kind of regions or still necessary conditions where uh, a catalyst has to exist. So uh, for example, we, we see that if uh, you want to guarantee the you want to have guarantee the existence of an exact catalyst, you actually need, for example, all the Rennie entropies and the Berg entropy to uh, to be monotonic in uh, from from your initial to final state. And that is actually also sufficient in order to guarantee a catalyst. And um, there are nuances, of course, in, uh, for example, the, the, these conditions will change when you allow for correlations, but there are some caveats here. For example, if you, if you are in the situation of correlating catalyst and you actually violate many of the Rennie entropies, then you would have to compensate for that by using a very high dimensional catalyst. So, so interesting as that is, we will be moving on because we, we still want to talk a little bit about thermal operations. And um, I won't really go so much in the case of embezzling because we've heard a little bit about it already. And um, things can get very tricky when we uh, look at uh, relaxing, uh, having some error on, on the final catalyst because there's the chance of stealing resources from the catalyst. Um, we know kind of the boundary where, where, the, con where the theory becomes unconstrained, but other than that boundary, we, we don't really know if there's a clear cut way of saying that um, inexact catalysis is not, not cheating, for example. Um, so um, coming to thermal operations, so how do they differ? Um, and you've already heard this disclaimer from, uh, from Paul that uh, in general, this is much harder because of uh, this, the, the energy coherences and we don't know how to deal with that in a way that gives us uh, necessary and sufficient conditions. Um, <clears throat> uh, I think this is a problem which is solved probably only for, for a single qubit. Um, but as long as the initial or the final state actually is energy incoherent, then thermal majorization is both necessary and sufficient. And uh, it's also known that if you are willing to extend the free states uh, further, then they can also become necessary and sufficient for, for all states. But people are not entirely satisfied with this because um, for the case of extending free operations, um, it's not always immediately clear what is the uh, physical meaning or interpretation of these extended uh, free operations. So um, at least for the case uh, that uh, you have one of the states being energy incoherent, we know that these are good enough, um, but otherwise we still have thermal majorization as a necessary but insufficient condition. So um, there is already a lot of different works on this uh, problem. And uh, with that disclaimer, we, we look at thermal majorization, which involves not uh, the eigenvalues, but the, the expectation values of uh, projecting the states on, on a fixed energy subspace. And of course, whenever you have a, a state which is energy incoherent, um, then um, one of these, uh, these R vectors would actually coincide with the, with the energy eigenvalues and uh, with, the, with, the, well, with the spectrum of the state, actually, sorry. Um, so good, uh, what is thermal majorization? So we've seen the, the formal entropic formulation already from Paul, um, but I will describe this a little bit with uh, uh, visually 
uh, a figure that looks very much like the Lorentz curve, just because it's, it's more intuitive. And uh, indeed, on, on the y-axis here, you are still plotting the, the cumulative probabilities, um, R1, R1 plus R2 up to, up to 1. But then on the x-axis, something different is happening, which is you are pl plotting out actually the corresponding uh, Gibbs um, factors of e to the power of minus uh, beta uh, epsilon. Sorry. And you can actually, these are all proportional to uh, the eigenvalues of the thermal state of the system. Um, beta would come from the, from the bus that you are planning to use in, in the thermal operation. And uh, you would have to plot these points in, in order that the entire curve is, is convex downwards. So we would say that uh, once you plot out a, a thermal majorization curve for some, some rho, and you do that for rho prime, um, and if the curve of rho lies entirely above that of rho prime, then um, we say that um, we say that rho thermal majorizes rho prime. So as you can see, this depends strongly on, on the Gibbs factor, which comes from the thermal state. Uh, and in principle, um, the Hamiltonians of the initial and final states can be different, but, but most, for most, most purposes, people study the case where h is equal to h prime, and uh, therefore the thermal state is q is also equal to q prime. Um, we have a generalized version of the Hardy Little Polya theorem, which shows that thermal majorization is equivalent to the existence of a classical channel that brings q to q prime and r to r prime. So that is, um, it, well, for example, when Q is equal to Q prime, this would be just a channel that preserves the Gibbs thermal uh, distribution, which kind of makes sense. So um, unfortunately, some of the nice feature in, in majorization starts to, well, be lost. Uh, for example, you cannot in general uh, achieve this anymore with just uh, a series of two level mixings. And also the bus size has to be um, arbitrarily large in general, uh, not the same as the system. But that just shows you how the ad uh, additional energy constraints here actually affect the, the majorization theory. Now, fortunately enough, the, the analog of Schroer convex functions still follow very nicely over to this region. So as long as you have a convex function, you can construct a monotone that will necessarily hold with respect to these thermal operations. So for example, if you take uh, the function of x log x, this is convex uh, because, well, the, just evaluate the second derivative and you can show that that's, that is non-negative. And um, that allows us to actually plug this into um, the, the theorem and say that, um, and conclude immediately that the, the, the relative entropy will, will always decrease, uh, which is, a, a, of course, a statement about free energy decreasing. Uh, but however, x log x is not the only convex function out there. And all the Renyi entropies, for example, were uh, Renyi relative entropies or divergences uh, will also uh, behave the same way. Um, so we are away, if we are away from the ID limit, then the free energy alone is not enough to characterize these state transitions. You would have to look at the entire uh, spectrum of Renyi divergences. Um, and this is, of course, what is known as the second loss uh, plural of quantum thermodynamics. And uh, quantum versions of these are still necessary monotones when you deal with coherent arbitrary uh, states. It's just that when you satisfy this, this um, uh, energy incoherent uh, condition, then they become both necessary and sufficient uh, for catalytic transformations. Um, Second feature, when it comes to steepest and flatter states, this is also a bit of a, uh, uh, well, bittersweet mix mixture because we can, we can prove the, the uniqueness of these flatter states still uh, for thermal majorization. But we can also prove that for most cases, um, the row steep does not uh, exist anymore. So there are different ways. Uh, there would be incomparable states that lie, lie on the boundary, for example, uh, in general. But nevertheless, these constructions are still somewhat useful uh, tools for us to study um, approximate transitions uh, for thermal operations in a slightly 
limited way. Um, and the picture of catalysis is actually not so different from, from, uh, from noisy operations itself, because we actually know that in, um, in uh, thermal operations, um, most of the time using a catalyst with trivial hamiltonians is quite sufficient. Uh, the only two things that I would point out here is that for exact catalysis, you would again um, recover the Rennie divergences as necessary and sufficient conditions for to guarantee the existence of a catalyst when you are in the in the quasi classical regime, of course. And uh, another interesting thing that has kind of recently been explored, which is um, because you can when you when you have uh, a system and a catalyst which are both coherent in energy and you allow correlations uh, between them, then you can actually um, amplify the amount of coherence in the catalyst. But this, this is actually quite recently uh, only discovered and a lot of study is still um, undergoing in, in this process. Um, here, uh, I basically have, have a short list that illustrates the, the use of uh, resource theory theoretic thermodynamics so far. Um, we have applied this framework, for example, uh, to show um, work extraction in the heat engines, um, to derive um, the third law rigorously, um, to study, well, how fast can we do algorithmic cooling and, and prepare pure states uh, for computation. Um, it's also recently used to derive uh, fluctuation dissipation theorems. Um, we um, Resource theory is also the part where we actually started to realize uh, the that catalysts actually um, are useful in, in quantum thermodynamics. Um, and then we kind of tried to study this in the, in the context of fluctuation theorems as well. Um, and finally, uh, we are also recently using this as a model, for example, for thermalization in, in many body physics. And that gives us a handle on uh, deriving some analytical results, um, uh, which is not, not usually very easy uh, in, in this context. So um, that was my uh, two cents for, uh, for this general talk. And uh, this is kind of just a summary slide to, to bring us through kind of what was, uh, uh, what was discussed a little bit in this talk. Um, the, and the history, the entropies, and uh, the differences between noisy and thermal operations, and uh, some of the technical tools. And um, I think with this, I conclude my talk. And uh, I hope you guys have somewhat enjoyed this. Thank you very much, Nelly. That was a uh, really great talk, um, covering a lot of uh, from introductory to some very interesting physics. So yeah, thank you very much. Um, we've got a little bit of time now for some questions. If there are any from the audience, um, I think, or um, put the question in the chat. There's some of the chat coming here. Um, okay, so there's a question from Chris Campbell saying, um, you mentioned that these thermal operations are heavily dependent on the eigenvalues of the system. Does that mean that projecting, projecting on a degenerate system would be favorable in thermomajorization? Um. Projecting on a th thanks for the question, Chris. Uh, let me let me read the question a little bit so so I know I I think I understand. Let me understand what they're trying to ask. Um, <clears throat> so some operations are um, I guess dependent not on the not really on the eigenvalues of the system, but whether the system actually has any coherence in the energy eigenbasis. I think that was the the main statement. So if there is uh, coherence, uh, both in the initial and thermal uh, final state that you want to reach, um, then thermal majorization uh, really um, is only necessary. It doesn't tell us whether there really exists a transformation. Um, but uh, once there is a state which has some uh, well, no energy coherence, then we can safely use thermal majorization to tell us whether the transition is possible or not. But I don't really get this, this point on the 
depending on the eigenvalues of the system though, I must say. Um, And there's a, a, a second question saying, um, uh, is there any relation between the uh, Renyi entropies and stochastic entropies or Shannon's surprise? Or, uh, so the, the Shannon entropy is actually a particular case of the Renyi entropy. Um, so we have, uh, sorry, I didn't make this clear enough. Um, so we have the, uh, well, here we have actually the divergence, which you can easily translate it to uh, just the, the entropy. And if you take the limit where alpha goes to one, this allows you to recover directly the relative entropy, um, which corresponds directly then again to the, the von Neumann entropy, which we know uh, is actually just the Shannon entropy of the, the spectrum of the state. Um, so indeed, uh, the Renyi family is very related to the, the Shannon entropy uh, in the sense that uh, the Shannon entropy is a particular limit. So, sorry, uh, I, I was referring to the, to the surprisal. So this uh, minus the log of the probability. So this kind of stochastic entropy that is used in a lot in the stochastic thermodynamics. Uh -huh. um, so just a surprise. Yeah. Um, I think, so I'm not sure whether I would fully know what the stochastic entropies are, but uh, maybe this is actually quite related to the blood entropy, which is the summation of all the, the log of the, well, the surprises um, in, in the distribution. So uh, it is actually very related to the Renyi entropy. Uh, in particular, it's the derivative of the Renyi entropy at, uh, at alpha So maybe that's, uh, it's much closer to. <laughs> 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 